Welcome to another scriptural study. In this scriptural study, we will be sharing a brief synopsis, a Coles Notes and or Cliff's Notes version, if you will, of a book of essays entitled As the Fate of Empires and Search for Survival by Sir John A. Glubb and its intended message for humanity as compared to the scriptural message which is contained in the book of Daniel as it relates to the prophet Daniel and his prophetic statue of empires as we can read in chapter 2, let alone its intended message for humanity. The intent and purpose of this scriptural study is organized under three categories, and they are as follows. In category one, we will be exploring what has human history to date revealed about our ability to govern ourselves, let alone our ability to govern nations and our empires. And in category two, we will explore the question on what has scriptural prophetic history revealed to us all in advance about our ability to govern ourselves, let alone govern nations and or empires. And finally, category three, and its question on what does Daniel's statue and the scriptural message reveal about our future ability to govern ourselves, let alone our ability to govern an empire and or a nation. On to category one. The author of these historical essays on the fate of empires and search for survival was born in 1897. And during his lifetime, Sir John A. Glubb published many books chiefly on the Middle East, including historical writings of the challenges of securing peace in this region. And he lectured in Britain, the United States, and Europe, with and through his writings, which included The Fate of Empires and The Search for Survival. Glubb's most remembered works attempt to quantify the repetitive, systemic life cycle of empires, from their humble beginnings up to and including their decadent declines. He begins by pointing out that, quote, the only thing we learn from history is that men never learn from history, end of quote. There is another saying that mirrors Glubb's quote, which states, those who ignore their past are doomed to repeat it. And as such, Glubb also addresses the blinders, many nations, yes, the blinders people wear when examining their own history. Because isn't it true that many people wear blinders at times to protect their illusions? Thus, robbing themselves of seeing the bigger picture, let alone the rewards that come with pursuing the bigger picture. As such, Sir John A. Glubb summarizes his essays, The Fate of Empires, in the following manner. A. We do not learn from history because our studies are brief and prejudiced. And noble Bereans agree with this comment because we observe this approach all the time and thus define this approach as what is known as the partial approach, where history is only viewed relating to a part of history rather than the whole. And thus, this partial approach creates a regrettable bias which always produces an incomplete view of history. Glubb goes on to say in point B, in a surprising manner, 
250 years emerges as the average length of national greatness and or the life cycle of an empire. And finally, C. This average of 250 years has not varied for 3,000 years and 250 years is equivalent to approximately 10 generations each. He also provides six repetitive stages and are the six phases of the rise and fall of empires. And when we read about this in his essays, we get an eerie sense that we all today are indeed living in what he defined as the sixth and final stage and our final phase of an empire in which he always defined as the age of decadence. In this final stage of an empire, again, known as the age of decadence, he provides great details on what decadence is marked by, let alone just what the true root causes of decadence are, and where this decadence originates. Furthermore, if there is indeed any honesty and or humility left in this world, it is not that hard to comprehend why the world is truly in another age of decadence. Yes, Glub historically explained how each of these empires all went through these six repetitive stages throughout history and all ending in what he called the Age of Decadence. Just as the prophet Daniel prophetically stated in advance with the image of the statue, but more on this later. Because we have a question. Isn't it true that the saying with the word insanity is all about doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results? So why do we human beings fail to govern ourselves effectively, let alone miserably fail? And thus, why has this historical search for survival proven over and over again that human beings cannot effectively govern themselves and or their nations, as they do indeed come and go in the very same manner? Many that have read Sir John A. Glubb's Fate of Empires come to the undeniable conclusion that we never learn from history, which is known as a truism. But why is this so? Glubb suggests three reasons. Number one, we only examine small periods of history relevant to our own country. Yes, the pitfalls of a non-scriptural partial approach when also applied to history does indeed cause so much confusion and anarchy. And we all know the chaos that the sin of a partial approach produces with anarchy throughout history, don't we? Yes, when this type of prideful, non-scriptural, partial approach is allowed to actually happen. Glubb continues with point two and states, within these periods, we vainly preen and celebrate just our own country. And the words vainly preen literally mean to behave or speak with such an inordinate high level of pride that the original approach to uncover true history, embarrassingly as it is, becomes an exercise in self-satisfaction only, rather than a full and complete realization of empirical historical truth in its entirety. And finally, number three, when Sir John A. Glubb stated that when we do look at world history, we look at short, 
unconnected periods. Sound familiar? Yes, the impact of the partial approach is devastating. And thus, the immense and undeniable fact why insanity will prevail. As we truly never learn from history, which has indeed become a regrettable truism. Just as history has proven over and over again, in such a predictable manner. How then could anyone be surprised in the slightest why we find ourselves once again living in another time period within another age of decadence? As shared previously, and regrettable as it is, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And all because in each age of decadence, hubris abounds, which is known as arrogance, excessive pride, and a self-confidence based on an extreme subjective feeling of superiority, driven by blind human pride, which some people define as narcissism, which we believe is indeed the intended message of Sir John A. Glubb's essays on the consistent and repetitive fate of empires and the search for survival, which truly reveals the insanity behind doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results, which the historical record to date has proven that we do indeed struggle immensely to govern ourselves, let alone struggle even more so to govern the nations and empires we attempted to manage, as they all have come and gone in the very same manner throughout history. And thus why the empire we live in today will be no different. But hallelujah that we do have a historical scriptural example, let alone examples of the value-added humble approach that eliminates the partial hubris approach. And is this why what has been is what shall be, and what has been done is what shall be done, and that there is no new matter under the sun? Yes, those who have a love of scriptural historical truth will indeed gather in steadfastness with the full and complete light of historical truth and thus will understand who is to this very day the staff of authority as it relates to human history, past, present, and future, doing their very best to not participate in the sin of partiality. And is this why only the very few will fully understand why human history proves that we cannot truly govern ourselves and or the empires we have failed to manage? Scripture is clear. Yes, the full and complete human historical timeline has been designed and forecasted in advance to humble us, just as the scriptures state. Is this not the intended message and purpose of Sir John A. Glubb and his essays on the fate of empires and the search for survival? Isn't it true that a partial approach with anything, let alone the study of past human history, has always created the inevitable and regrettable human characteristics of a partial approach due to hubris all through time. Okay then, on to category two of this scriptural study. Because wasn't this the same intended scriptural message from the prophet Daniel in chapter 2? 
Isn't it historically true that the prophet Daniel provided us a view of human history in advance on just how a non-scriptural partial approach to self-governance, let alone that any government in any empire would inevitably fail? Due to the human characteristics of a hubris approach? And isn't it true that Sir John A. Glubb's writings on the dangers of partiality, which lead to hubris, gave us this message with history after the fact? While the writings of the prophet Daniel give us the same message with history before the fact. And isn't it true that scripture, as it relates to human history, and scriptural prophetic history is designed with a purpose and intent that we are all indeed to be humbled by it as per the writings of the convener that if understood in full points us all to the one true shepherd and teacher on the purpose of predestined human history furthermore When we deep dive into the original writings of the book of Daniel, we learn quickly why chapter 1 and chapters 8 through 12 were originally written in Hebrew, and just why chapters 2 through 7 were originally written in Aramaic. Because in chapter 4, we do find the ill effects that the king of Babylon experienced firsthand. Did not Nebuchadnezzar have a hubris partial approach to governing himself and his empire? Was this the same hubris partial approach of governance which led to the immediate death of Nebuchadnezzar's son named Belshazzar, who became king? which followed swiftly with the demise of the Babylonian Empire itself, just as the historical and archaeological record reveals. And as stated originally by the prophet Daniel, in advance, as we can read in chapter 2. Yes, the prophet Daniel recorded the fate of empires in advance. Yes, Daniel knew human history before the fact, before it would happen. Furthermore, the prophet Daniel was fully aware that the non-scriptural hubris partial approach to self-governance, let alone the same non-scriptural approach with the governance of the empire itself, would inevitably lead to its fall and or demise. And the prophet Daniel knew well in advance that as each race and culture, with their individual brand of non-scriptural religions, based on the traditions of men, always would originate from a hubris partial approach, and as such would come and go as well. Just as he foretold in advance with the empires of Medo-Persia, and Greece. And has it been any different with the Roman Empire? Yes, indeed. History has proven that the eastern leg of the Roman Empire has declined due to the ill effects of a hubris partial approach to governance. And is this why Sir John A. Glubb believed that the final leg of the Roman Empire Yes, the western part of the Roman Empire would experience a steep decline. With that final stage of existence, he called the Age of Decadence. Just as the prophet Daniel was fully aware, well in advance, that there would indeed be two legs of the Roman Empire let alone just why their combined inevitable demise would eventually occur. So, what's next? This brings us to Category 3, 
the final portion of this scriptural study with the question, what does Daniel's statue and the scriptural message reveal about our future ability to govern ourselves, let alone our ability to govern nations and our empires? Well, if we read further into chapter 2 of Daniel's book, we come to learn that the final installment of what some call the final human experiment of self-governance, which ends with verse 33 of chapter 2, which many believe share the possibility of the final ten empires with ten leaders and or ten kingdoms of human rule in the final age of decadence. Where this final configuration of human governance, yes, the final experiment of human governance, takes the world into the Great Tribulation. And again, because we do not learn from human history and our scriptural history, due to our ongoing massive hubris non-scriptural partial approach, this final experiment of human governance will fail at such an extreme level, and so much so, that it urges or demands the following scriptural question, which is, isn't this why the Messiah, Yahushua himself, stated that during this time period, it will be so bad, like no other time in human history, that the Messiah Yahushua himself also stated that he personally would have to return to save us from annihilating all flesh on earth. Meaning that if this experiment of self-human governance, known as the Age of Man, was allowed to continue further during the tribulation time period as per scripture, we would indeed destroy all living flesh. Yes, we would ultimately destroy all living creatures due to our continued hubris and non-scriptural partial approach to self-governance as proven in the way we have governed ourselves and our empires all through time. Isn't it true that the scripture states that there is a way that seems right to a man? but its end is the way of death. And isn't it true that the Almighty Father of Lights, with his perfect gifts from above, provide further proof that his thoughts in ways which do not change are not like our thoughts and ways? Which further proves just why noble Bereans constantly question themselves and continuously study why the human condition all through history does not trust the governance of Yahuwah, but rather leans only on the understanding of men. Is this why the human condition and its partial hubris approach continuously ignores the message of past history, let alone prophetic history? As the human condition, in which some call human frailty, consciously ignores why history repeats itself? And thus, as regrettable as it is, those with the partial approach miss the mark, and our intent, and our purpose of past history, let alone prophetic scriptural history, which was given to us and or designed to humble us. And isn't this why the many who practice the hubris partial approach to prophecy only focus on their private interpretations, even though scripture advises against this? As an example, the many, with their partial hubris approach, believe they are the only ones who can interpret scripture. And worse yet, are only concerned in a partial manner with who and what the final ten kingdoms will be 
just like this proposed private interpretation of Psalms chapter 83 that privately predicts a final confederation and her empire ruled by 10 Islamic leaders. And are the very popular private interpretations from the non-scriptural, self-proclaimed governing body of Christianity, with their proposed view of a ten-nation European confederacy. And are the private interpretations of the worldwide ten empires of the Club of Rome. What? Ever this final configuration of the human experiment will be, isn't Daniel's message bigger than the question on who and what it will be? But rather, and far more importantly, isn't the bigger question, why will this final phase of self-governance fail so miserably? And isn't this why so many of the private interpretations from the many partial prophetic timelines throughout history always miss the mark as well, as they were nothing more than a design distraction from the hubris partial approach in having the many act like dogs, chasing their tails in a continuous circle. And thus why there is no need to allow anyone with a hubris partial approach to bring you down this rabbit hole. Because the scripture is clear. We must realize that past human history, let alone scriptural prophetic history, has been given to humanity for the sole purpose of being humbled by it. But since when did the guidance and our clear-cut directions of Scripture stop any of the millions of hubris people and their partial approaches with the Word throughout history, and their private interpretations of it. Isn't it true that all through history, world religions have followed the same hubris partial approach in governing themselves just as empires do? including the various so-called Hebrew roots and messianic movements, as each one of these groups and or movements and some of the individuals within them state that they and or they alone are truly somehow so much more special above the rest. Have not these actions and non-scriptural behaviors all through history captured the spirit and definition of what it means to act in a non-scriptural, partial, hubris manner that is designed to keep everyone chasing their tails in desperation? Isn't world religion and those in them provide even further proof why human history and scriptural prophetic history has not humbled any of us yet? And it gets worse because millions and millions of these same folks in these movements all throughout history have and continue to do everything in their power while they are alive to self-proclaim and to self-elect themselves to power and or some authority in order to erroneously convince you that they personally will govern over you in the kingdom and or empire to come. Isn't it true that only 144,000 will reign in the millennial kingdom with the Messiah Yahushua? So why have millions and millions of people still tied to the traditions of world religions state otherwise. And the number keeps growing, doesn't it? As the many continue to lean on their own understanding. However, none of the millions and millions of people all through time who have self-proclaimed, and are better stated, personally promoted themselves as being part of the 144,000 are even aware that those who sit on the thrones during the millennium will have been killed 
and are beheaded for their witness to the Messiah Yahushua, let alone the other requirements as per the book of Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 through 5, etc., etc. Because isn't it true that when you personally self-proclaim and are self-elect and or self-promote yourself to anything in life, is this an action and or even a behavior of trusting Yahuwah with all your heart? And or is it an action and behavior of leaning on your own understanding in a partial and possible hubris manner? Please read book one of Shemuel chapter eight, because they as well in Israel demanded that their human rights were to be heard. Yes, their partial hubris approach made them delusional as well, as they desired self-governance. And as such, they rejected the almighty Yahuwah as their only king to reign over them. And ever since then, the world has been learning the hard way on what it means to be careful on what we erroneously think we can actually self-appoint to govern ourselves, let alone our empires, based on the non-scriptural hubris partial approach. Israel as well was not going to allow human history, let alone scriptural prophetic history, to humble them. And to this day, with the human experiment of self-governance, Humans erroneously believe and think their rights supersede our almighty Yahuwah and his right to rule over us. Thankfully, many are waking up and are asking the right scriptural questions that reveal why Yahuwah has allowed this little human experiment of self-governance only to exist for a short period of time. And just why the final phase of the human experiment of self-governance will be an epic failure as per the word. Because what if humans do not know what is right? Is this why the little human experiment of human governance is failing so miserably here and now and setting itself up for an epic failure in the future? Why are even the human rights movements struggling to govern themselves? Is it possible they as well have not yet been humbled by the purpose of human history, let alone scriptural prophetic history? After all, isn't it true that scripture states that Yahuwah, yes, the one who is known as the sovereign of the ages, who the world has rejected, actually thinks and acts differently than we do? Who indeed, in the various human rights and or social justice movements today, wants to go on the podium to admit this scriptural fact? Here is an excellent question. How many in world religions, let alone the Hebrew and Messianic movements, who self-proclaim they are part of the 144,000, even admit that it is only Yahuwah, yes, our Father of Lights, who is the only Sovereign of Ages, and that all existing and future governing authorities are and have been appointed by Him, and him alone, all through time, for his purposes, in order that we may be humbled by it. So, why then do the citizens of all governments today, and in the past, which were appointed by Yahuwah, oppose authority, when this is known scripturally as the institution of Yahuwah? Why then do those who oppose the authorities that have been appointed by Yahuwah bring judgment upon themselves? Is it possible that those who are not humbled by human history after the fact 
and our scriptural prophetic human history before the fact, possibly may bring judgment upon themselves, just like the scriptural example of judgment with the Israelites, who showed no humility due to their scriptural hubris partial approach, in order to incorrectly demand a human king. And do we not have examples of this very same thing happening with those still associated to world religions? What about those who self-proclaim that they personally have the authority to privately interpret scriptural prophecy? What did our only teacher, the Messiah Yahushua, state about that? So, of course, the Messiah stated, do not attempt to supersede things that the Father of Lights has put in his own authority. And again, and of course, the Messiah Yahushua would respond in this manner as he does not practice a non-scriptural, partial, hubris approach. Does our only teacher, yes, the Messiah Yahushua, provide any further guidance on why we struggle so to govern ourselves effectively, let alone the nations and our empires we are to manage? Because isn't it true that even the Pharisees knew that the only teacher, yes, the Messiah Yahushua, and his words fully supported the way of his father, Yahuwah? and that the Pharisees even publicly admitted that the Messiah Yahushua did not practice the non-scriptural, partial, hubris approach with anyone. As the non-scriptural, partial, hubris approach of the Pharisees backfired on them, when they asked the Messiah Yahushua if it was right to pay taxes to Caesar and or not, and boy, oh boy, did they get an earful when the Messiah Yahushua said to them, Why do you try me? Because the Messiah Yahushua went on to say, and I paraphrase, Yes, Pharisees, you are not special in any way, and as such, you must pay your taxes. To the Roman authorities that the Father appointed for this time period, and he knew if they opposed the authority of the Father, they would indeed bring judgment on themselves. And this response by the Messiah Yahushua shut the Pharisees up completely, as they marveled at the Messiah's non-partial response. Yes, we are all to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and as well, give to the Almighty Yahuwah what is his nothing partial, and are hubris with this response. So, another big question is this. How many of these groups who state they are special above the rest are preaching this message that the Messiah, Yahushua, taught the Pharisees? Let alone the millions and millions of folks who have self-proclaimed themselves on their own authority of being part of the 144,000. Hallelujah that our only teacher, yes, the Messiah Yahushua, yes, our only shepherd, yes, with the staff of authority, who is never partial, and or demonstrates any sign of hubris, who is indeed fully aware of all things that have been done and will be done under the sun and for what purpose. So, in closing category three of this particular scriptural study and the question, what does Daniel's statue and the scriptural message reveal about our future ability to govern ourselves, let alone our ability to govern nations and our empires, based on human history, let alone scriptural prophetic history? Isn't the bottom line this? We need Yahuwah, don't we? Isn't the prophet Daniel's scriptural prophetic message stating this as well? That we all need 
Yahuwah to help us remove the sin of partiality, to eliminate our hubris approach to governance by respecting and allowing human history to humble us. Because have we not proven time and time again that we cannot govern ourselves? Just as this final phase of the little human experiment is soon to come to an end. Just as the scripture is designed to remind those to not take a partial and or hubris approach to the full and complete prophetic historical timeline. Yes, a straight and level approach to the words of prophecy and then to guard it as it relates to the message of the epic failure of the human experiment due to the continuous, non-scriptural, partial hubris approach of all humankind. Whether or not any of us wants to admit it here and now. Furthermore, doesn't the word share that the Messiah Yahushua will return, announcing that the human experiment of self-government is done? And does not scripture share that the Messiah Yahushua at this time will indeed return to start the cleanup process, so to speak, known scripturally as the restoration of all things, with those who he and his father have approved, and not the millions and millions who have erroneously self-proclaimed themselves for this position all through history. And does it not also state that by the end of the millennium, when the Messiah Yahushua has put all enemies under his feet, including death, then and only then will he deliver up the kingdom unto his father Yahuwah, as per 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24. Because isn't it true that the Messiah Yahushua gives his last one example of not acting in a partial manner and or with a hubris approach, as he does not keep the reign for himself, but rather gives the reign back to the Almighty Father of Lights when he has brought to naught all rule and all authority and power. It is an undeniable fact that we have proven that we cannot govern ourselves and or the empires we were allowed to manage for a time, as recorded with human history after the fact, let alone the scriptural history written before the fact, which the world is about to witness in full, which Yahuwah himself has predetermined, whether we have been humble by this and or not. We continue to call upon the name that these scriptural study videos provide value to you and your loved ones. Until next time, Yahuwah willing, all the best in the name which is above all names.